thing that we all have to learn to live with is, is that we have to recognize that we are not an island to ourselves. We have to share this world with other people groups. Sometimes what? People different than ourselves. And as our, as our lesson suggests, we have to learn to what? To grow together. We got to learn to get along together. We got to learn to live to, how to live with these other people that we, when, when, when we was growing up and it was predominantly black, you know, everybody spoke blackish. So it wasn't that hard to get along with it. But now we, we got to speak pinkish and reddish and all the other rainbow colors. So our lesson today, uh, the focus is, is going to teach us how to grow together in a diversified society. And, and Jesus is, is going to use a, a parable that in the King James Version, it says the parable of the wheat and the tares. But, the, but in most modern day uh, uh, translations, it, it'll be the wheat and the weeds. So, as, as, we, as we begin our lesson today, does anybody remember the definition of a parable. We talked about the definition of a parable. Thank you. It's basically an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. The word parable comes from the Greek word parabole, power, preposition, alongside, bole, to cast, which means to go on, uh, cast on side, alongside. So a parable it, it is a method of teaching where you compare one thing with another. And in Jesus' ministry, it was taking something common and everyday life that everybody clearly saw and recognized and comparing it with some great spiritual truth that Jesus was trying to get us to see. Okay, now, now I'll, I'll, I'll be reading mostly from the New King James Version of the Bible. Uh, you read from whatever translation is most comfortable for you. I promise you we will uh, meet somewhere in the middle. So I, what I need, I need someone to begin uh, our, our reading at verse 24 of Matthew 13. Someone read that verse for us, please. So, uh, so now, from this portion to uh, the end, almost the end of this section, Jesus is going to be introducing a series of parables about the kingdom of heaven. Now, what is the kingdom of heaven? How many of you remember the Lord's Prayer? Okay, what is the first petition of the Lord's Prayer? First of all, we recognize our Father, His location, and then the, what, what's the next, the first sentence, next sentence is a petition. Okay, your, your name be hallowed and your what? Your kingdom come. You see, these series of parables that Jesus is giving called the, the mystery parable of the kingdom of heaven is the is to answer the request of, of the Lord's prayer when he says, your kingdom come. And notice it says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that kind of gives you an idea of what this kingdom is. The kingdom of heaven is God's rule on the earth. Is it because you remember in the very beginning, God ruled over the entire world. Because he created it. But he gave authority over this world to who? I'm sorry. To, to, to us, human, human beings. Particularly, what was that gentleman's name? Start with an A. 
Adam, he did, he says, have the meaning of the world. So, so as long as Adam obeyed God, God moved, or God's kingdom was upon this earth. But did Adam stay faithful to God? What happened? He disobeyed, and, and he gave the rule of this earth over to Satan. So God's kingdom is no longer ruling over this world. And so, so Jesus is going to give a series of parables to describe what it's going to be like when God's ruling over this earth. Okay, very good. Okay, so how does Jesus start this parable? He talks about something common to everybody in that day. What, what's the word picture? In verse 24, what's the word picture? The kingdom of heaven is like? Okay. Once again, he's using the what, agricultural uh, uh, illustration to prove a spiritual point. And this is, and this is cons uh, like the other parables of the seeds. But this time it's focused on one particular person and only what? One type of seed. And what type of seed does Jesus uh, talk about here? What's the, what's the word that describes the one seed, this one seed? It was good seed. And so Jesus is saying, uh, there was a farmer, a landowner, who went out to his field and he purposely planted good seed. Which, which, which means what? That, that, that this man wanted something good to come from his crop. So, so it tells us what? If you want something good to come out, you got to you tell them, Sister you better put something good in. Because see, what you get put in is what you're going to get out. Okay, so this man wanted a good crop, so he planted good seeds. Okay, okay, I need someone to um, read verses 25 and 26 for me, please. Back in those days, um, everybody didn't put a watch over their field. Number one, you know, they, didn't have, they probably didn't have the servants to do it. Number two, why would anybody mess with an un, ungrown field? In other words, if a thief's going to steal something, he's going to wait to what? It produced fruit. Then, why would he come in to, to, to a field that doesn't have anything? So they figured, we don't need to watch this field. But it says an enemy came in. Now, Jesus does not tell us who this enemy is in this particular portion of the parable or how this enemy came to hate this man. Maybe the man did something to him. You know, sometimes we can do stuff, you know, unaware us that make people angry. And, and you know what kind of world we live in today you can kind of look at a person wrong and they want to come and do something to you. Now, I was in a grocery store the other day and, and two guys got, out, got in, in the uh, checkout lane where I was at and it all started because one guy apparently looked at the other guy wrong and he said, what you looking at? Yeah. You know, and that led to a series of words and, yeah. and, 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 a, and, a, and a fight almost broke out and the manager had to call security. But, 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 it didn't start when the person did something to that person. Just, so, so we don't know how this man got this enemy. But apparently he got this person who was so angry at him, 
so hateful at him, so bent for him, he says, I'm going to do something to mess up his, his crop. I know he's planting good seed, but while everybody's not looking, I'm going to sneak in and put some King James Version, tarot, but, my, but still, but the Greek word means weeds. He purposely planted weeds among his good seed. And, and, and uh, this verse should remind you, don't be surprised if you got enemies. Because Jesus said, if they hated me, this is what they're going to do to, to, his, to his children. They're going to hate you too. But people, sometimes people may not like you simply because you, you're a Christian. You haven't done a thing to them. But because you name the name of Christ, so don't be surprised. He said, why that person don't like me? Don't be surprised. Because if, 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 if you name the name of Christ, and Christ has enemies, you're going to have enemies too. Now, after a period of time, you, you know how, how the plants begin to first break through the ground, and you see the kind of top of the heads of the, of the plants or the grass or whatever you plant, they begin to kind of first come up. They discovered something else came up too. What was it? The tares. They said, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> they, they said, they said look, look, look at, look at, uh, uh, look at verse, someone read verse 27 and verse 28 for me, please.
because I don't want those weeds to get established. But someone read verse 29. Okay, so sometimes, you know, we do need to get rid of the weeds. But other times, like this master says, you need to leave them alone. And why did the master tell his servants to leave those weeds alone? Back and pull up the, the weed. Because you see, we have to understand that in this particular culture, the type of weeds that the enemy sown is that in the early stage of growth, you couldn't tell them from a, from, a, from a weed stalk. And so you may think you're pulling up a weed, but you're actually pulling up, you know, some of the weed. And the master was wise enough to understand that, that, that in this particular case, when you cannot clearly Distinguish a, a weed from a weed is best not to, to mess with it because you may actually de, de, you know, dis, de, you know, destroy um, the weed with it. So, so see, this tells us that we need to be always careful about everything we do because in our zeal to solve a problem, we may what? We may create a problem, make things worse. So that's why it takes wisdom. And that's, and that's why we need to always go to, to the Lord and ask him, Lord, how do you want me to handle this situation? Because see, like these servants, our natural tendency would be to what? There's a problem, let's get in there and solve it. But that may not be the proper thing to do. Okay, now, someone read verse 30. Okay. okay, thank you so very much. So remember, the wise landowner told his servants, leave them alone. Because number one, in your attempts to pull up the, the weeds, you may actually pull up the weeds. And so he, tell, he tells them to do something that I'm sure that, that probably chafed them. He said, let them what? Both grow together. Can you imagine going out to your yard and trying to water your grass and know, and know that you're watering those weeds too? Yeah. And, and you fertilizing and cultivating your grass and you know you're cultivating and fertilizing the weeds too? See, sometimes it, it's, it's, it's hard to say, oh man, I don't, I don't know if I can just live with this problem. But you see, the wise master says, let them both grow together until what? Until the harvest time, which tells us that, that some of the things that we may have to be asked to endure, we're put up with, is not going to last forever. But, 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 but we may be asked what? To endure, to put up with them for a period, a period of time, but, but, but we won't have to do it forever because there's going to come a time when those, when those things we've been holding on to, putting up with, it's going to be over with. And it's going to become a time of separation, of separating the wheat from the weed. What happened to the, to the, to the, to the weeds at harvest time? They bundled them and burned them. What happened to the wheat? They, put, they, they took them out and, and uh, Put them, put them in, put them in the barn. Okay, so so this is a parable. So we have to, we have to, uh, okay, we, we have to skip over to 
verse 36. Now, someone, someone read verse, verse 36 for us. Okay, so 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 a period of time has happened. Jesus has concluded speaking to the crowds in parables, and he gave the benediction, and he says he went into the house. Now, most as we shared last time, most likely this is a house of Simon Peter, because as we shared with you last time, Jesus said, "Birds of the air have nests, foxes have holes, but the Son of Man have nowhere to." So this could be Jesus's house. So most likely, uh, this was in Capernaum, which was next to the Sea of Galilee. And so he went back into to Peter's house. And while he was there, the disciples came to him and asked him to explain the parable. Now, again, this, this is teaching us a very important lesson. The number one person that you need to go to when you don't understand anything about the Bible is God himself. We thank God for pastors, teachers, evangelists, and so forth. But, but Paul said in 1 Corinthians, he said, no one knows the things of the Spirit except God alone. And only the Spirit can discern spiritual things from spiritual things. So, so what I'm saying is this. And, uh, and I learned this when, when I was going to Criswell College. When I first went to Criswell College, I was intimidated because all those guys had, had the doctor in front of their name. And I said, ooh, these guys, I said, these guys must really know it. But I found out that just because they have a doctor in front of their name, they don't, they don't walk on water. Yeah. That, 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 uh, that they don't know everything. And, 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 and a lot of times I, I fought real hard. I'm telling you, I fought real hard to get up and tell one of the professors, hey, that's how my mama told me. <laughs> you know, because my, my, my mama and daddy, they, they taught me the Bible. And, and so I said, oh, I said, oh, I feel like saying, hey, that's the way, not the way mama told us. But, but my point here is that whenever you don't understand the scriptures, before you turn to the commentaries and ask other men, Go and ask God to speak to your heart and say, Lord, explain to me this portion of the Bible I'm, I'm reading. Sometimes they say you're a trip. Go on to another. Okay, so that's good. Okay, so let's, let's go ahead and kind of hurry up because it's almost time to uh, kick up the offering in a few minutes. Someone read verses 37 and verse 38 and 39. We'll take those together. Someone read those verses for me, please. Amen. Thank you so very much for that. Now, Jesus began to tell him you know, what this parable means. First of all, he said that the landowner or the farmer who planted good seeds represents who? Okay, who is the son of man? Jesus. When Jesus was here on earth, he went by several titles. And hopefully you know that Christ wasn't his name. Christ was his title. It's the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah. But probably one of the favorite titles that Jesus used was the Son of Man. Now the reason why he used the word Son of Man, it represented deity in human form. That this human Jesus that everybody looking at is really the Son of God. So, so he said that Jesus is the one who sows good seeds. 
You know, the, you know, I was reading the Psalms the other day where David says, 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 Lord, you are good and you always do what is good. You see, we must never ever fall for the lie of the devil when the devil tells us, you know, you know, look at what you're going through. How can that be good? But you see, we have a good God who always does good things. And, and what may seem bad to us, God is behind the scenes doing what? Working it out for what? For the good. So remember, don't let the devil lie to you. Everything that God does is good because he is good. Now, verse 38, it says the field is what? Okay, field is, is this world that we live in now. Okay, so, so it says that Jesus planning something good in this physical world. Okay, and what did Jesus, what is a good seed that Jesus planted in this world? Okay, the, the children of the kingdom, which means God's people. Did you know that if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, Jesus has planted you here. Because in Jesus' high priestly prayer in, in John uh, 17, Jesus said, Lord, I don't pray that you take them out of the world, but I pray that you keep them in the world and keep them safe. So, so Jesus has planted us here. If you're accepting Christ to be his life, his witness for him, because Jesus is not here anymore, so the only only Bible that people are going to read is what? If Jesus is not here, who's the only Bible the people of the world are going to read? No. You. You. Dr. J. Berman D. tells the story of a, a of a white preacher who was in the train station and he gave a black man a gospel track. And the, the black man says, said, what is this? He said, it's a gospel track. I want you to read it. And the black man gave it back to him. He said, that's okay, sir. I'll watch your tracks. So, so you see, Jesus has planted us in this world to be his life witness for us. Okay, but also what? Okay, the, the tares or the weeds represents who? The wicked one. Because you gotta recognize what? Everybody in the world is not saved. That that basically and, and basically we have to recognize that there's two types of people in the world. There is the good people and there is the bad people. There is no middle category. Some, some people say, well, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna choose Christ, but I'm not gonna choose the devil either. I'll just be neutral. You, you heard the word agnostic? People say, well, I don't know if the I, I, I don't know if the Bible is right, I don't know if the other religions are right, so I'll just I'll just be agnostic. I'll just say nobody, thank you. Nobody knows. But you see, in this world. You're either going to be children of God or you're going to be children of the wicked one. You have to make the decision. And, and, and you can't straddle this. Fence. Okay, hurrying on. It says the enemy who sold them is who? The, the enemy who sold them is who? The devil. Do you know that the devil is going around trying to get people to follow him. That's right, some of them are. See, just as Christ is trying to call people to follow him, the devil is trying to call people to follow him. And if you reject, and, and if, you, and if you reject Jesus, then you automatically say you want to follow the devil. Okay, remember I told you, there's no real ground. You either follow Jesus or you follow the devil. And so the devil is going out, and the Bible says he's deceiving people and seducing people 
to follow him. Now, the harvest represents what? What is the harvest? The end of the world. The okay. The harvest represents, you know, the end of the world, or in the, in the Greek text, the end of the age. Now, very quickly, when God created this world, he purposely didn't mean for it to last forever. He had, a, he had a beginning time for this world, and he has an ending time for this world. It's called the end of the age. And at the end of the age, the reapers who are, someone already said it, the reapers are who? Who, who, the, who? The angels. And, and the angels go forth. You know, they're the reapers. Okay, someone read verses 41 and, um, Read, read 41, 42, and 43, and we'll conclude. Amen. Thank you so very much for that. As we kind of hurry to a close, Jesus tells us the purpose of this parable. This purpose of the parable it is to illustrate that in this world, we're going to have to live with the devil's kids. And, uh, and, and, that, and that just like the wheat and the weeds in the early stages, you can't tell the difference. Now, can we be honest for a minute? Can we truly just be honest? Doesn't sometimes some simple, unsaved people do some nice things? And, and you might actually think they're a Christian. And can we be honest? I'm, well, this, this family, this talk. Can Christians, born again Christians, sometimes do some mean and nasty things you might want to? Is that person saved? You see, that's the reason why Jesus said, let them both grow together. Because, see, we don't have the discernment to look at a person's heart and know whether or not they're truly born and saved again by their actions. Because sometimes Christians do some bad things. Sometimes wicked people do some good things. Now, when, when I was, now, uh, raise your hand if, if you if you remember this, when I was little at, at Great Emmanuel, when they had a uh, large supper, they would go around with the tray, and they would, before they served you the tray, they would ask you a question, have you been baptized? Anybody remember that? Yes. Well, well, see, see, because see, the large supper is only for baptized believers. But you see, Pastor Hudson is with them, like the Lord Jesus, he recognized that some of these folks saying that they're <laughs> probably not baptized. And some of the people who said, well, I don't know, may, may, may be baptized believer. So, so that's really why we have what's called open communion today. We just serve everybody. And, and we, let, we let the Lord deal with the individual heart, whether or not you, you're drinking it in damnation because you're not really born again. Because we cannot discern who the, who the Christians are, who the non-Christians are. That's why we got to leave it to God. Now, you know she said the angels are, are going to be sent in and they're going to uh, separate the wheat from the weeds. They're going to take, you know what she says, they're going to take everything that, that, uh, uh, that word of thin is a word standard Scandal, this over, which we use the word scandal, anything that causes sin. Because you know, there are some people that love to try to stir up some mess. That seems to be their uh, vocation. But they're going to be taken out. And they need that practice. That, that means that the lifestyle, they love living wickedly. See, all those, anything.
thing that, that smacks of wickedness, the angel is going to gather them up and, and it's going to, this is going to throw them into a, 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 a furnace of fire and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, this furnace of fire is not hell. This furnace of fire is a lake of fire that's described in Revelation 20. Remember, this is at the end of the age. This is at the beginning of the earthly kingdom of Jesus. And when you read Revelation, you find out that when that happens, all wicked people are going to have their part in the lake of fire, their permanent residence. See, people in hell right now is only there for a short time. Then they're going to be taken out of hell, stand before the great white throne judgment of Christ, and then they're going to be given a chance to prove why they should go to heaven. And when they, prove, when they show that they don't have enough good work to get into heaven, Jesus is going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. And they're going to be put in the lake of fire. But notice it says, uh, wailing and gnashing of teeth. Anybody think, anybody think they know what that means? Okay, well, that's okay. That's why I'm here. It, it basically means that those who are lost is going to spend all of eternity screaming and howling and saying, I wish I had accepted Christ. I wish I had went to church when Mama told me to. I wish I, I, had, I had came forward when the preacher gave the invitation. It's going to be regrets for, for, for the missed opportunities. And, and they're going to discover along their life they had many opportunities. It's going to be regrets for missing those opportunities. And then it says in verse 48, and I close with this, and I'll go back and explain to you what I said before. I don't want to be in this group in verse 43. And hopefully you won't either. And I'll tell you why in just a moment. It says, then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, in, in, in this text right here, you, you see the word uh, uh, shine forth. That comes from the Greek word et lampo. Do you hear, the, do you hear something in that word? Et lampo. The word lamp. You get the word lamp for it. It means out, means to shine out. When, when you take a shade off of your lamp, what happens to that light? It gets bright. It gets bright. I, mean, you, I mean, you can't miss it. So you see, with all the wicked people gone, the righteous will be able to be everything that God wants them to be. Now, I, I, I tease you a little bit by saying, I don't want to be a part of uh, verse 43. And he said, Preacher, why you don't want to be part of verse 43? Because you see, my Bible tells me, Jesus in John 14, he says, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And when and, and in my father's house and many mansions. And where I'm going, I want you to be with me. And he said, What? I will come and get you. He didn't say I will send your angels to come and get you. So, so that means that the angels that separate the, the wicked from the weak are not, uh, not, the, not, the, not the one who comes and gets us, the church. It's, Jesus is going to come for us, those of us who, who believe in the rapture of the church. He's going to personally come for us. He's not going to, and I thank God, I want to see Jesus. I don't know about you, I want to see it for myself. Jesus is going to personally come for me and take me back to where he He's been in. So, so, so these righteous that, that, that we have here are those who, who, who have gone through what is called the Great Tribulation Period. Because there will be people saved during the Great Tribulation Period. In fact, 144,000 Jews are going to have to seal God placed upon them. These are the righteous who's going to shine forth. And I say this very quickly, and I'm getting ready to go. You remember that portion in Matthew 25 where, where Jesus said, there will be two working in the field, one taken, other left. There will be two sleeping in the bed, one taken, other left. A lot of people say, oh, that's the rapture. That's not the rapture. Because if you look at the context of what Jesus is saying, he's talking about the kingdom. And so he's talking about this period right here. 
The one taken is the weeds taken out to be burned. And the one left is the one left to be put in the barn to enter the kingdom of God. So that's the reason why I'm telling you that I don't want to be a part of verse 43. Now, if you want to be a part of verse 43, enjoy the tribulation. God will bring you through it, but enjoy the tribulation. So, but the, but the application of, of this lesson is still the same. While we wait for our Lord to come and get us in the rapture, we're going to have to live with the devil's kids. And it's not our job to try to discern who belongs to the devil, who belongs to God. So you remember I told you sometime, uh, uh, Christian people can do some pretty bad things, and, and wicked people do some good things. So it's not our job to try to determine who's, who's a Christian, who's not. We, we leave that up to God. But, but, but we need to recognize and we need to warn these people that a day of separation is coming. And, and that now is a time to hear the voice of God calling them for salvation. Now is a time to accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior because they don't want to wait until that time of separation when the angel is going to come and the angel is not going to ask them, do you want to get saved now? The angel is just going to gather them up and go into the lake of fire. So, so today, let us know, first of all, who you are. Make sure that you know whether you are weak or weak. And if you know you are a, a, a weak, let's do what God has planted us here in this world. Let's be a light and a witness to those who are not. But also let us not try to de determine who's saved and who's not, but just, just preach the gospel to everybody we get a chance to. And then wait for that great day of separation when Jesus is going to separate the weeds from the weeds. Let, let us pray. Most gracious Father in heaven, how we do love you and thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, for the reminder that while we wait for our Lord and Savior to come to us, we're going to have to live with the devil's kids. And sometimes they're going to get a little hard to live with. But we pray, Father, that you would give us grace and mercy to be your like your witness in this dark world and to those who are outside of the faith. And we pray, Father, that we'll warn the wicked to turn before it's everlasting too late. For the day will come when the wicked will be taken out and they will be cast forever into the lake of fire. Help us, help us to serve you, worship you, and to do your will. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, I apologize. Uh, we have one visit. Well, we have two visitors here. Okay. I want to just mention we have Gary Johnson. Okay. Brother Johnson. And what's your name, sir? Terry. Terry Payne. Okay, Brother Page and Brother Johnson. All right. Thank uh, you. We, 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 uh, we're going to formally welcome you when we get to our morning, sir, but we thank you for sneaking in and being part of our Sunday school. I apologize that we didn't get a chance to give you any comments or ask you any questions, but uh, be with us next week as we wrap up our study of the parable of Jesus. So, we, so until next time, may God richest blessings be yours.